Okay, in today's lecture, we're going to learn about rate laws, which is a quantitative relationship for describing how concentrations of chemicals, molecules, atoms affect the overall speed of a reaction. So let's look at this and pose some questions and some things to think about. How do we determine what affects the concentration of each reactant? How that affects the rate of the reaction? So the rate of the reaction is the speed of the reaction. That is sort of the the fundamentals of kinetics, how fast does a reaction occur? But we know that concentration will affect said reaction. And in the previous lecture, we saw that borne out in tables and, and graphs and data, but it's actually more complicated. We know that reactant concentration affects the rate, but it is a one-to-one -one ratio. Is it a uh, squared ratio? Is it you know logarithmic? What is the quantitative relationship? And how do we determine that experimentally? So that's what we're going to talk about today by introducing the concept of a rate law. So that's what this lecture is primarily about. The way we do this in an experiment, and all of kinetics is really driven by experimentation. You then build the theories of the reaction mechanisms from the experiments we're going to talk about today. And the way we do this is by keeping the concentration of everything constant except for one reactant and see what happens to the overall reaction so that we tease out that specific reactants effect. So if you have A plus B plus C goes to D, well, first you hold B and C constant and change A and see what effect it has on D, right? Is it a one-to-one -one ratio? Then you hold A and C constant and change B. Maybe you double B and D goes up by a factor of four and there's sort of a squared relationship between them, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how we do it experimentally. We move through reactant A, then B, then C, holding the other two constants constant uh, and seeing what effect it has on the overall conversion from reactants to products. Now, let's look at this in some tabulated data uh, for a given reaction shown here, where we're really uh, converting this ammonium ion and this nitrogen dioxide ion uh, into some products. What the specific products are, aren't really important for the rate of the reaction. We know we can express the rate, as we learned last lecture, from either reactants or products. Here we're just looking at reactants. Now, the rate law overall shows the relationship between the overall rate and the concentration of reactants. And this is something really important. The rate law, okay, is always going to look something like this, but it's always only in terms of the reactants. So in analogy to this reaction shown here, the rate law could be equal to something with A and something with B and something with C, but D will never appear in this rate law, okay? And the reason is we're setting up a reaction by mixing A, B, and C together and letting it go. And we want to know how the rate of that reaction proceeds based on those concentrations that we've set up. Okay, so the rate law is only dependent on the reactants here. Never list a product in the rate law. Okay, this is the quantitative relationship between this rate and the concentration of all the reactants. And we'll get to this, but there can be powers up here like twos, threes, some integers, uh, or there can be a one, which is implied, or it can be to zero, which means it doesn't really exist. Anything to the zero is just one. So uh, let's look at this math formula though that really expresses how the rate depends on the concentration of each reactant. Uh, one other thing I'll point out first though is this K here. This K is a rate constant. Okay. The rate constant is really the purpose of this is to correct for units. And it sort of uh, encodes or, or has the uh, temperature dependence of the reaction built into it. And we'll see that in future lectures. Uh, we'll learn about Arrhenius and his uh, great contributions to chemical kinetics. Uh, but this K you'll see in all rate constant or rate laws, I should say. Uh, and it's just a rate constant. Um, 
it's a constant only at that certain temperature, right? At different temperatures, there are different rate constants, but it also corrects for the units. Now, the rate law we use to determine reaction order as well. And we'll see that in the coming slide. So uh, imagine we have this sort of uh, data like this for NH4 plus and NO2 minus, uh, and we'll actually do the math on this to extrapolate uh, how we come up with this overall rate law from this data. But first, just going through sort of uh, each part of the rate law in a little bit more uh, detail. The exponents tell us the order. So some vocabulary, vocabulary we need to know here for the rate laws. The exponents are the order. So I'm going to write a general rate law that you could see. For a reaction. Okay, now this is not exactly typical, but I just want to uh, show an example. Okay, the reaction here is A plus B goes to C. Now, this overall reaction, you might think means A and B, the dependence on how fast this happens, is a one to one ratio because the coefficients, the stoichiometry, is one to one. Okay, but that's absolutely wrong that's not the way kinetics works okay the overall reaction is more a balance of where do you start and where do you finish but it doesn't tell you exactly what's happening at the molecular level okay we talked about this in the previous lecture feel free to go back and watch that video you can't just take these coefficients and make them the exponents that is a very very common thing for students to do and that will get you zero points okay these have to be determined experimentally and these exponents tell us the order of the reactant, uh, of the reaction with respect to each reactant. So this would be uh, second order with respect to A, and third order with respect to B. Right? The exponent tells you the order with respect to it. Overall, it is fifth order adding up the exponents. So this is just some vocabulary we need to learn, right? And this order tells us something about, as we'll see in future lectures, the molecularity, which means how many of these things need to bump into each other for a reaction to occur. So this complicated rate law actually, as I said, is not typical, but it suggests something about two A molecules having to bounce together, right? The overall reaction here suggests A bounces into B and makes C, but that's wrong, okay? Chemists write these things out for where the thing starts and where the thing ends. It doesn't tell you how many things bounce into each other to create the products. And that's really the level of detail we need to know to figure out how to make a drug to block that process or uh, make a catalyst to encourage that uh, reaction to occur if we're trying to remove uh, certain pollutants from our cars, for example. So we need to know the reaction order to find out something about the mechanism. Now, uh, on the example from the last slide here, if this was our rate law, we would say, well, the one is implied here for each of these, and that this is first order with respect to ammonium and first order with respect to nitrogen dioxide ion. It's second order overall, just adding up these reaction orders. Okay, As we've said before, K is the rate constant. It makes sure the units work out and it's temperature dependent. Now, these orders, just to drive the point home, must be determined experimentally. Okay, this is super important, right? Because the tendency is for people to look at the overall reaction and guess at what the orders might be and derive a theory for how reactants turn into products. But you actually have to set up experiments here's six different experiments and follow these concentrations to determine what the observed rate is and thus the order with respect to each of these reactants so that's really what we're after today to understand how we would do uh, such a thing okay so uh, quickly what i want to show you here uh, in this table of data how do we get this rate law it's not given to us right they're determined from experiments. So let's just look firsthand, and I don't think this is the practice problem, no. 
uh, firsthand at how we come up with this rate law, right? And how we come up with this rate law is the following. What we're going to do, as was suggested here, we keep every concentration constant except one of the reactants and see what happens to the rate. So we know the rate law is going to look like this. Rate equals okay, K times each reactant. And here the reactants are ammonium and nitrogen dioxide. But what we don't know, remember, is the order. So I'm going to put an X and a Y here. Okay, this tells us they're ones, but I'm giving you this for free. Let's see where we come up with those ones from. I can immediately write this from the reaction, okay, having told you that ammonium reacts with nitrogen dioxide, right? You can immediately write the rate law as this. But now we have to determine X and Y. The way we do that experimentally is to set up various experiments. So let's look at something. Let's just look and compare experiment one and two. And really here we have more experiments than we need. We really probably only need three here, but we can look at a couple of these. One and two, NO2 is constant, not changing. So whatever happens to the rate here is solely determined by this change. So how we actually do this is, well, we put in a beaker, this much NH4, this much NO2, okay? We pour them in and we watch how NH4 disappears in time. We catalog the time, we catalog the change in concentration, we divide those things out to get our concentration per time, our observed rate. We did lots of those calculations in the previous video. Okay, so here we set this experiment one up, we get this data. We set experiment two up, we get this data. Now we can compare the observed rate, okay? Big number over the small number, 10.8 over 5.4 is two. So the reaction experiment two is twice as fast as experiment one. So the rate, has doubled, and this tells us, since I held NO2 constant, since the rate constant isn't changing, this tells me the dependence on NH4+, plus because that's the thing I changed. So really all you have to figure out here is, you know, two, what happened to NH4? It doubled. Two is two to what power? <gasps> I wonder, I wonder if I can solve this. X is one, okay? So that's where the one comes from. You plug in the data overall, you see the rate doubles. When this doubles, so it's first order. So let's do the same thing, but instead, pick two experiments where NO2 changes, right? But NH4 does not, okay? Well, that's easy enough. We can pick four and five. In four and five, NH4 is not changing, but NO2 minus is. This is doubling. And what happens to the rate? It doubles. So it's the same thing. The rate is doubling while NO2 minus is doubling. I don't have to worry about NH4. I don't have to worry about the K. That'll cancel out. So two to the Y is two. Well, Y is one. So that's how I knew in the end that these were both ones and we don't have to write the ones. There we go. So that's how we go through and determine this. Let's actually put it to work here in this practice problem and use this data to determine the rate law as I just showed you how to do it, the rate constant and the rate of the reaction for this last set of conditions. Okay, feel free to pause the video here and try it yourself before I go through and solve it. Okay, so immediately seeing this, I'm gonna just concentrate on the reactants. Right? And I'm just concentrating on the reactants because I know the rate law just depends on the reactants. So rate equals K, concentration of first reactant to X, concentration of second reactant to Y. So now let's go to the data and look, maybe we'll look at experiments one and two. I'm gonna choose those because one stays the same and B doubles. So from that data, I can say what happens to the rate. The rate stays the same. It doesn't double, it stays the same. So I'll write a one for the rate. K I'm ignoring. A I'm ignoring because it's constant. B doubles. So this is the equation I have. Two to what power equals one? Well, Y here has to be zero. Again, I picked two experiments where one of the reactants stayed constant. The other changed, 
and that will tell me the order with respect to B. I double B, nothing happens to the rate. So the overall reaction is zeroth order. It does not depend on B. Anything to the zero is one, so that's not part of the overall rate law. We can do the same thing, but try to determine A. And for determining A, well, I'm gonna pick two experiments, one and three, and I'm gonna pick those two because that's where B stays the same, but A changes, and that'll let me tease out the effect of A. So let's look at one and three, okay? Three, 16 divided by four is four, so four is the effect on rate, and four equals this doubles two to the power of x. Two to what power is four? Well, x here is two. And that's how we figure out the overall rate law. Okay, so our rate law here for this practice problem is rate equals k times a to the second power. And that's our overall rate law. That is part a. So the answer to part a is rate equals k concentration of A squared. Okay, it's second order with respect to A, and it's zeroth order with respect to B. Now, for part B of the problem, what is the rate constant? Rate equals K A squared. In part B, I want to figure out the rate constant, and what's nice is, now I have an equation for the rate law. I can pick any single one of these reactions, doesn't matter, and plug it into the rate law. So let me plug the first experiment into the rate law. 4.0 times 10 to the negative 5 equals K. A in the first reaction is 0 0.100 squared. So 4 times 10 to the negative 5 is K times 0 0.01. And in the end, the k value is going to be 4.0 times 10 to the negative 3. Okay, and that'll be my rate constant for part b. However, make sure you don't make this mistake. Always include your units here on the rate constant. And the units can get a little bit confusing, but realize that overall the rate is always molarity per second. And the concentration here is molarity, and that's squared. So that suggests that the units here, for everything to work out, the units of K is molarity times seconds. That'll ensure that one of these molarities cancels, and I'm left with the rate units of molarity per second. So here the rate constant units have to be four times 10 to the negative three, with the units one over molarity times seconds, or sometimes you'll see this written as molarity to the negative one, second to the negative one, okay? And so that's your part B. Your part C here, the rate of the reaction when A equals 0.5 and B equals 0.1, well, we have K, we have an A value, we plug them in again to the overall rate law, and the rate is going to be the K value we just figured out, 4.0 times 10 to the negative three, over molarity over seconds times the concentration of A and part C were given 0 0.050 molarity squared and now we solve for A or we solve for the rate 0 0.05 squared times 4 overall then this gives us 1 times 10 to the negative 5 molarity per second remember the units of rate here should always be molarity per second so that's our answer for part C. Okay, so this is how we actually use experiments to figure out the rate laws. And this, I mean, can get a little tedious, right? But these are straightforward examples. What I want you to concentrate on, in addition to being able to solve these quantitatively, is appreciate what this really means. Okay, and what this really means is if I'm trying to create a drug, right, that targets some active site of an enzyme. The way I figure out what is the mechanism for the reaction that I am trying to inhibit, okay, I figure that out by mixing up 
amounts of the active biological molecule, amounts of the enzyme, and figuring out from a bunch of different concentrations and a bunch of different experiments here, okay, what is the rate law for the reaction I care about? And once I know the rate law for the reaction I care about, this two, as we'll see in future lectures, this two right here tells me that A bumps into A somewhere in the reaction, and that's the important part. That's the part I want to target. Even though this reaction up here looks like A has to bump into B to make C, no, the most important step, and this is what the rate law tells us, is it's dependent on two A's coming together, which you would not necessarily guess from this overall reaction. And so in designing something that inhibits this process, you really need to know that two A's are coming together. How do you thwart that process to turn this reaction off? Okay, so that's really the, the conceptual application that we're trying to get to just by working up through some of these examples, through learning some of this vocabulary to talk about rate laws, how concentration affects uh, rates of reaction, and the overall point of kinetics by going through some of these uh, practice problems. So hopefully that helped. In the future lectures, we will get into these concepts of mechanisms, of how temperature affects mechanisms of catalysts and enzymes as we build up to this molecular level understanding of reaction mechanisms. But that'll do it for this lecture. See you next time.